Hello? Oh, this is too loud. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. Thank you for joining the uh, multi site session. We're going to talk about TriCircle today. Um, if you see me going into palpitation on the stage, don't worry, I have stage fright. Um, so, today with me is supposed to be my friend Pino. Thank you. Uh, there he is, uh, the CTO of Midakura. And what we're going to cover today is a deep dive into TriCircle. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm trying to move the. There we go. Okay. So before I dive into the technical details, first of all, some motivation. Why do we care about multi-site? Why do we want to manage multiple um, OpenStack clouds at all? So first thing that uh, pops into mind is geo-redundancy, right? You all just thought about geo-redundancy. No, I'm kidding. It's uh, just a fancy way of saying disaster recovery. Um, so normally when we're talking about uh, multiple clouds, that's the first thing that uh, pops into mind. Uh, second thing is service locality. So we want to be able to run virtual machines close to where they're needed for low latency or sometimes for legal reasons we want to keep our data on a certain uh, region and not uh, migrate it to places where they um, do not comply with the law. Um, of course, cost optimization. It could cost uh, less to run on cer in certain times on uh, one site rather than the other. Um, we get use cases in from the OPNV um, work group. I will, this is basically about how to manage virtual network functions. I will not uh, cover that at all. Um, you've got the classic cloud bursting scenario, right? When I have uh, my resources are dwindling on one site and I want to start sp um, spreading out to other sites. And this really becomes even more interesting in the hybrid cloud scenario where I have my local OpenStack and I want to burst out into Amazon. Um, but what we really want is to do this using um, OpenStack APIs. So we actually, this is not just theoretical, we have a uh, project about this as well. And my colleague Eshet Galor will be giving a session today in this room at 5.30 about that. Okay. So you understand what the use cases are, what, the what are the requirements? So we want to be able to have a global resource uh, management, right? right? I want to provision virtual machines across um, sites. We want single resource utilization dashboard. Basically, I want to see the statistics uh, of my sites in a single place. I don't want to go jumping around between dashboards. Um, perhaps more interesting is so uh, cross-site virtual networks. I want the, the usual L3 peering uh, scenario management and um, perhaps in some use cases, I also want cross-site layered, stretched layer two networks. Now, this does not mean that we want to uh, start propagating um, broadcasts across the WAN, but it does mean that if I have the ability of taking a virtual machine from one site, copying it to the other, and I don't have to start modifying it internally, changing the IP, the MAC addresses, that could be really nice. Um, to provide this, of course, uh, uh, um, prerequisite is, uh, is identity management, right? Single identity management, be it using a federated keystone or a um, single stretched keystone. Either way, uh, this is required. Um, more technically, we want to use the OpenStack APIs. Um, two years ago, maybe um, everyone was talking about the AWS uh, APIs. Today, we actually want to use OpenStack API to manage all clouds. Um, we want to manage this as an aggregated resource pool, right? A single resource pool from which I can carve out uh, resources regardless of their physical location. Um, we need to minimize traffic over the WAN, cost reduction, uh, better performance, things like that. Uh, of course, our global management system cannot be a single point of failure, so service continuity. And we want uh, the user experience to be uh, comparable with single site uh, management. So to solve all these uh, things, we've introduced TriCircle. 
So what is TriCircle? TriCircle is, an, uh, is a project meant to do the management and orchestration for multiple sites. As you can see, um, we have OpenStack APIs at the top. Is this? Ah, you can't see it. Never mind. The users interact with a single OpenStack API, single dashboard. Uh, it goes to a top site or a top uh, management layer, which then uh, distributes the requests down to the separate sites. Now, down below, you can see we have uh, disparate resources in, in the sites, as well as cross-site resources like, the, like what you see in purple, which is a single uh, network cross-sites. From the user perspective, the experience should be pretty much the same. The only difference is the fact that when you're launching a, an instance, you have the data center um, drop down, and you can see that here. Launch instance has data center, which is new. Other than that, every, everything should be the same. Um, if we take a look at all our instances, you see under availability zone, you also have um, the name of the site in which that availability zone is located. Okay, take a deep breath. We're going to dive into the technical details. <laughs> okay, so we've been uh, running this project for nearly two years now. Um, this today is running in production in Huawei Web Services, the Huawei Public Cloud. Uh, it's running uh, in production in other areas, and we've really learned a lot in these two years. So what we did is we started with the concept saying, we want to take OpenStack itself in order to manage OpenStack. Um, this is a nifty idea. It's not revolutionary. It's uh, similar to the way Nova used to manage vSphere as a single compute node, right? So we have a single site aggregated um, and uh, abstracted away using a single compute node. Um, this works, but uh, this is what we've learned, right? OpenStack is really uh, single-minded. It was built, designed, and uh, implemented to manage a single site. So introducing multi-site concepts into a uh, piece of code that was uh, designed and developed for a single site <coughs> requires a lot of creativity. Um, you need to take care of things like uh, uh, consistency and automicity. Your bottom sites are not uh, homogenous, right? I can have OpenStack, even different versions of OpenStack while I'm doing upgrades, right? So one version here, one version there, or I can use um, the reference implementation for Neutron in one site and ODL in another. Let's say I have size uh, considerations, etc. So all these things really um, require some kind of a leap. So what we've been doing in the past few months is we've been working on an experimental architecture. Now, what we want to do is to learn how to improve the current uh, solution we have to be even better, right? It's already in running in production, but we want it better. So what we said was, okay, if we had a clean slate, what would our architecture uh, look like? And then how do we evolve our solution to be this architecture? Um, so of course, we're still providing OpenStack APIs. So we've got un unmodified API management layer at the top. Um, but from there on, instead of reusing Nova and the different uh, components and intercepting the requests down at the compute node, we've actually immediately intercepted the requests um, here in the adapter layer, which I will explain now. Um, so what does this uh, layer do? Well, uh, what it does is it intercepts the requests and it abstracts away, it's a stateless layer that abstracts away what I present to the user or to the administrator and the way I manage it at the bottom. So today if you go to the uh, dashboard, you can see you have multiple uh, compute, um, compute nodes, right? And they represent in the existing architecture, each compute node represents an entire site. Now we may not want that, we may want to manage uh, at the top availability zones or even drill down to the level of a single compute node on each site. This flexibility is important because this also determines the granularity of our dashboard reports, right? So really what the adapter is, is an abstraction layer from what we're presenting to the administrator or the user 
and how we're managing it underneath. So then the next part is uh, the workload distributor, this piece here. So once we intercept the request, we build it, rebuild all the information that we need, we add the site information, etc. We pass it to the workload distributor. This is, this is not a service, a full-blown service. All this does is distribute the requests or push the requests into different queues. The way we build the queues is, again, a deployment issue, not a design issue. Why is this important? Because this uh, determines how we uh, manage the, how many top services we have. So basically, in a very simple, simple implementation, we don't want to come and install, you know, 10 nodes just to manage a single or two sites. So we can start with a single global, um, global queue, a single top service, and uh, that top service manages all the bottom sites. Um, some nomenclature, right? We call the top, the top service top, and the bottom sites bottoms. Uh, <laughs> we thought it's, uh, it's uh, pretty simple to understand this way. I could just as simply um, go back to the view that we have today right, a single uh, service managing a single site, but because this is deployment, I can uh, split my requests uh, across uh, tenant queues and uh, scale in this way. Now, this layer really gives us flexibility in how many top services, how we scale the top services, okay? So this becomes a deployment question. Um, so what does the top service do? Um, basically, Something that I have not told you up until now, when we run uh, create network at the top, we usually don't pass it down to the bottom, right? I don't want to create a lot of resources down at the bottom until I really need them. So when the user comes to run a virtual machine in a certain site, that site may not have the networks, the, the virtual router, lots of things that are required uh, in order to fulfill this request. So a simple create VM command becomes now a transaction that needs to be managed. So the thing, first thing we need to do is build um, the dependency list, right? To understand what the list of operations are that we need to run. So that's uh, the dependency builder. Then the job builder takes all these operations, builds a, uh, a job description, right? And passes it down to the bottom side to be executed as an entire transaction. We don't want over the WAN to start passing create network, wait, create virtual router, create port, et cetera, right? We want to pass once a bunch of operations to run, manage the execution locally, failure is uh, less likely because uh, there, there's no WAN in the way, and then just let me know the final result. Did it succeed, did it not? If I'm really interested, I can pull in the middle for status updates. I will not go, due to uh, lack of time, I will not go into detail about the consistency monitor and the data access layer, um, but they're there as well. Um, so that leads us to the bottom service. Once it got a request, right, it needs to be executed. Now, we did not want to reinvent the wheel and start managing transactions and job uh, execution, et cetera. So we introduced a pluggable workflow engine. This can be uh, Mistral or Taskflow or any workflow engine of your uh, liking. We don't care. We pass it the job to be executed. It manages the execution. And really, if you think about it, most of the load resides here, right? So um, in this architecture, uh, most of the, the, the onus of the, or, of the bur or the burden of the work is here. And once it's, uh, it's finished, it can uh, notify us uh, of the result. Uh, another thing that the bottom service does is monitor changes on the local site. So we don't want to go polling across the WAN for uh, changes. So we've got this local service, which is standalone on the side of OpenStack, and checks to see over the LAN what changes have happened since the last time, creates a diff, and then only sends changes across the WAN up to the center. Now, it can, locally, it can do polling very frequently or uh, a publish subscribe uh, model where it gets notified of events and then passes them, caches them and passes them on to the top. So if I now have network failure, I can uh, then later send the, the changes to the top. Um, so basically that covers uh, my part. Um, again, as I mentioned before, uh, at 5.30 today in this room, 
by chance. Uh, my friend Eshet Galor will uh, be presenting the hybrid cloud solution, which is based on this solution. Um, I actually, uh, when I'm nervous, I speak quickly, so I'm actually a bit ahead of time. So any question, uh, questions about this part before I pass the mic to uh, Pino? Perfect. Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, so now you're uh, diving into the hybrid cloud uh, um, <laughs> solution. Um, you will recall, however, that we want to manage everything like OpenStack. So we want something at the bottom that speaks OpenStack APIs. Uh, we've got adapters. So Ishid will cover this today at 5.30. Other questions? Yes, I can see there. Okay, you. Okay, so this is a very good question. Um, Consider this, I want to provision a network on one site and the same network on another site. The network ID given here is not the same as it is given here. So I need, first of all, mapping information at the top, right? Um, second thing I need, is basically I, I need a global ID saying this is the network ID here and this is the network ID here, right? And then if I want to do uh, L3 or L2 peering, then uh, my uh, border gateways, which Pino will touch a little about, uh, need to know what's the global ID to, to map to, right? I get something on tunnel X, change it to tunnel Y, then the other sides get that and changes it to the local tunnel ID. Um, another uh, use for state, so IPAM, right? IP address management. I have, in the L3 use case, I have two subnets, um, and I need to make sure that I do not have the same subnets in different cl uh, clouds. Same goes for IP addresses. If I have a stretched layer two network, then I need to make sure not to uh, allocate an I the same IP cross uh, clouds, right? So there is some state. We're trying to minimize that as much as possible because state is evil. Other questions? Yes, there. So I cannot give you numbers about network delay, but uh, what we're doing for network uh, failures is very similar to, similar to what OpenStack does today. Um, first of all, no, no, I, I don't mean we ignore them. Okay, maybe that, <laughs> that was a wrong example. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what we do is we persist, first of all, persist the operation that wants to happen, uh, that is about to happen in the top uh, database. Uh, we are actually reusing the OpenStack um, uh, API data model, right? So we are uh, letting uh, Nova and, and the other API services update the database by, by themselves. We are reusing the code in this way. So we know that an operation needs to happen, uh, but in cases of failure, we need a healing mechanism, right? So we need uh, something at the bottom. Um, Uh, I don't have it here in the slide, but basically we're monitoring and uh, because we're performing uh, complete transactions here at the bottom, uh, we can roll back or roll forward to a consistent state here and then notify of the change to the top and let it um, uh, synchronize what the new state is. Other questions? Yes. Fantastic question. Okay, so the question was, how do I uh, manage cells, regions, things like that? So first of all, regions is an unimplemented feature in uh, OpenStack. Uh, we need to uh, populate region information in Keystone. That's part of the requirements. With regards to cells, so cells were really built um, with different um, assumptions than multi-site. Cells assumptions are, I'm in the LAN and I'm completely sharded. Right? I don't have cross-cell resources. They are different networks. They are different network topologies, right? Because I have two neutrons, things like that. So really, cells uh, took some simplistic uh, assumptions there, uh, which is good for them, and then they can just run as separate things. For us, a cell could be an availability zone or anything you want. You remember 
that from the top, uh, from the top we can present it however we want. So instead of um, sites, compute nodes, and availability zones, you could have cells there if you'd like. Other questions? If you're extending uh, your Ansu network, uh, the, the external network will remain on one side and then the traffic will be... Uh, so Pino is actually the expert on all things networking, so I will let him reply on that uh, later after he goes through the, his part. Um, let me pass the mic, and then if you have more questions later, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. I actually don't touch on layer two gateways in this talk, but uh, let's talk about them uh, when we've gone through this. So uh, it's great to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so I want to talk about um, networking from the point of view of the applications. Okay, and then we'll touch a little bit on implementation in TriCircle. But right now, I really want to, want to think, take the point of view of the application and ask, what do we do with a cross-site network, or what does it mean to have a cross-site network? So the ideal situation would be that network objects would be cross-site by default. And that means that starting with your Layer 2 network, it's extended. It's a stretch Layer 2 network across two sites. So I'm just showing here that we have a subnet, 192.168.10. And we have a VM on the left, some VMs on the right, okay? And uh, you already, you can see right away, and this was mentioned before, that you're going to need IPAM here because you don't want to allocate the same IP addresses on the left as on the right. And IP address management is single site. Um, although the orchestration, we can pull that into the orchestration layer. So, um, and then you have IP, IPAM anyway. So that's the first thing. Um, secondly, if you send a packet across just by having uh, stretch L2, you hit the port level firewall, the, the neutron security group. Now, are the rules in that security group configured the same way as the rules in the, in the VMs on, the, on in site two? Only if you have cross-site security groups. So right off the bat, if we want to do cross-site uh, application deployment, we need to have these features in the cross-site uh, implementation. So IPAM and security groups. Now, I want to, before I go on, I just want to point out that um, why, why do you want cross-site L2? Because people sometimes say, I want cross-site L2, and other people say, I can live without cross-site L2. Cross-site L2 gives you, perhaps, VM migration, okay? And you might, might or might not want to use that. It's, it's, uh, you know, it depends on your WAN uh, bandwidth. And then you want to have symmetry in your deployments. You want to use the same uh, IP addresses on the left and on the right, uh, the same configuration, the same heat templates, it's, and so on. And especially if you already have a whole bunch of orchestration, and you just want to use it in both sides, um, uh, that, that kind of symmetry that, that, that L2, stretch L2 gives you is very nice. Okay, so, um, and then of course, someone mentioned um, um, uh, partitions. So in the data plane, absolutely you have to be aware that it's not single site. We have partitions in, 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 um, in the data center as well, but you especially have to be aware of them in, in multi-site. So if you design for multi-site, you, even though you have stretch L2, you're still going to be aware of what you run where and you're going to uh, make sure you're, you're somewhat symmetric and you're not using the, LAN, the, 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 the WAN as much. Of course, if we're talking about a multi-site deployment in, in the same data center where, for example, you have a Kilo deployment and a Juno deployment and you want to somehow have them talking to each other, um, then you might have easier uh, requirements to meet on, 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 uh, on uh, WAN utilization, but you still have gateways usually between the clouds, depending on the implementation, and so um, throughput and latency still aren't as good as within a single site. Now, if you're doing cross-site, uh, uh, stretch L2, the next, thing that the, the next question that comes out is, okay, well, should all my networks be cross-site? And, and the answer is yes, because you want that kind of symmetry in, in deploying, your, deploying your applications. You don't want to manage different configurations on each side. That's the whole premise of doing stretch L2. So how do you do routing across two subnet, two, two uh, stretch layer twos? You put a router somewhere. So here I put the router in site one. But if I put the router in site one, VMs in site two that I want to talk to, the other subnet, end up having to do a traffic trombone. That's obviously not, not desired. And so what we'll end up doing is using a second router in the other site. Problem solved. Traffic trombone is gone. But now we ask the question, how do you implement this router? So consider that the routes have to be the same in the two routers. What about the IP addresses? If we use different IP addresses, then when VMs migrate, the default route of the VM must change. So what do you do? You propagate, maybe you wait for the DHCP information to expire and you can, or, you, or you proactively uh, install a new route in the VM. So 
the IP addresses have to be the same. What about the MAC addresses? The MAC addresses also have to be the same because otherwise we have to wait for the ARP table entry to expire when a VM migrates. So for all these reasons, you start to see that the cross-site router, uh, meaning a router that is mirrored on both sides and where the VMs don't have to be aware of which site they're in, the cross-site router now becomes a requirement of, um, of um, deploying your applications across, site, uh, across sites. So what about load balancers and firewalls? So firewalls, a little bit easier. Um, of course, you want the same rules on each site. And you know the, the classic use case we're talking about is you're doing DNS, DNS load balancing across the two sites, and then you've got a multi-tier application in each site, for example. Um, but you can manage your file as a service with heat templates, and, and you know, so it's it's easier. You can manage it even by hand. You don't you don't move these, you don't change these things a lot. Load balancers are more complicated. Because now what we're doing here with the load balancer is we've got to decide what the policy is for going across the WAN. So you may have a policy where you can use the WAN quite a bit, or you can only use it during uh, upgrades or during maintenance or during right, VM migration. So you have, this is why load balancers get, end, up, end up more complicated. And it's not even really a cross-site load balancer, because many people don't want that. You may not want that your load balancer on site one knows about all the backends in site two. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be crossing the WAN a lot. So I'll stop here in terms of developing this story. but. I'm trying, the message I'm trying to give is that if we do cross-site L2, okay, even if we use the network sparingly, the model itself forces, up to, forces us to offer from the very start a very complete solution. So that already means that we don't have a very nice easy path to getting to cross-site deployment of applications. So what's the alternative? Router peering is what I'm calling VPC peering, what AWS coined as VPC peering. Okay, it's the idea that you just peer two routers, okay, and we can we can extend this concept to peering n routers on a on a on a, on a stretched L2 segment. So the the key point here is, you have a choice between what you put on your stretched L2. You can put VMs on your direct, uh, directly on your stretched L2 segment, or you can put routers on your stretched L2 segment. And where I'm going to argue that this is the first step, it's an easier step to take, and it has some advantages. So. Um, now, I want to point out that in this diagram here, you have different subnets, different subnet addresses, okay? So you're doing some subnet management, and the orchestration layer can help you with that to keep your subnet prefixes different on each side. And then I've, I've designed this so that I'm using different slash 16s on each side. This lets my routing be pretty simple, okay? And this is just, this is what AWS does. And it doesn't, AWS doesn't allow peering between two sites um, that have overlap in their sort of, uh, uh, what is it, an address scope? Um, so, but, I, but I, I don't have a pretty uh, animation for this, but uh, you're still going to need security group synchronization across the two sites, so, so a cross-site concept of security groups because these two blue networks are blue on purpose. I'm trying to represent that we've split a, a tier, an application tier, into two different subnets, but it's still the same application tier, and they sometimes may want to talk to each other because you can still um, have, uh, you know, for certain purposes, a load balancer on the right could talk to a VM on the left under certain conditions, or um, you might want to, 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 to deploy your, your, uh, your, your migrating a MySQL, or you have, a My you have some uh, storage layer or data database layer synchronization or caching layer synchronization across the sites. So security groups are still a requirement. But with router peering, and, and I'm arguing that router peering is, is, is easier to implement, and, and security groups, we, we can start. Now, you're going to have to redesign your, your, your deployment templates, your orchestration, right? Because now you have to deal with tiers that have different prefixes. However, the advantage of this model is that if we start to talk about compatibility with hybrid, um, in, in the hybrid cloud use case or direct connect, we might have advantages there. So direct connect is another term, uh, AWS term, term. it's uh, ex express route in, in Azure. Um, and it's the idea that at the peering facility, the customer has a hardware router. And they want that hardware router to have direct access to, um, to, to their, to their um, virtual data center. OK, so there's a, la a layer three model. Um, and I'm not showing you here that there's a physical piece of equipment in the peering facility uh, that allows this layer two connection between the routers. Um, but that doesn't matter because you're, you're interested in the, we're interested now in the application layer uh, virtual network. So what I'm trying to show here is that 
what I, I expect the public clouds to do is to offer this model and that it's unlikely, I claim, it's unlikely that they're going to support a stretch layer two model. You can implement it using L2 VPNs, that's fine, but I think the vendors won't, uh, the, the, the cloud providers won't do that because it is more complex. Instead here, they're basically opening up a tunnel and then they offer BGP or dynamic routing over the tunnel and it's pretty simple from their end and they can even give you the, man the, the configuration uh, uh, to, to install on, on, on your customer router. Um, then very similar use case would be that if you are dealing with three public clouds, then you peer them all. Now I'm showing here that every pair is peered, okay, so this, it's, an, it's a mesh, but you can imagine, we, I, I would, we would strive for, and, uh, and so we've built a prototype of, of, of this where the three routers are on a single VXLAN segment um, to really push, dr drive home that point that you can put routers on a stretched L2 segment. But the point is that you can build this today with, uh, with uh, public clouds and, and your own OpenStack, this is the private cloud on the left. Um, and again, I, I make, I claim, and I'd like to hear opinions if they differ, that we're going to be able to do this in the industry on layer three, but we will not be able to stretch L2 into, uh, into public clouds. And conversation point. Okay, now, do we have to choose? So, uh, I believe the Neutron community should build these APIs so that we can support both models. After all, we're just stretching layer two, we're using some tunneling, VXLAN to start off, maybe, and, um, and then the, the components are very similar in terms of implementation. What I think will change is that the implementations, the vendor implementations will target, will sort of zone in, uh, zero in on one or the other. So for example, we're very focused on layer three. We're not going to look for scale uh, for, for now on stretched layer twos where you put VMs on, right? So every, every vendor will have a, have a, a point of view on that. Um, and, and, and my question is, uh, what, what's your use case? What, what do you need? Do you need stretch layer two? <clears throat> and why? So let's talk about it in a minute. Now let's spend a, a, a minute on, a few minutes on implementation. How am I doing on time? You left me tons, so. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Well, maybe pause five a little minutes. bit. Oh, five minutes, okay. Okay, so um, um, our colleagues at, at Huawei have come up with a, a, a great design where the goal was to be as flexible in, uh, as possible in terms of where you, you, you of, of how you can get cross-site connectivity across clouds. So they, they started off with a goal, um, you know, try to support um, any kind of open stack that existed in the past, okay? And, and, and they had to compromise on that a little bit. But the goal today is, if this site, site A, or if, if the sites support, um, maybe I think uh, um, probably ML2 and they have some sort of tunneling, with those two requirements alone, we can drop in a border gateway on each side that can connect the tunnels on the left to the tunnels on the right. And so we can impl implement either, we can implement stretch layer two. Okay, so that's great. Now, um, what is this border gateway? So I don't want to go into so much the implementation of the border ga gateway, but the, the interfaces of the border gateway, which allow anyone to create a border gateway. We at Midokura will be developing in, in Midonet a border gateway, um, and, um, um, and, and other vendors will have their own. Um, a a, 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 um, a uh, Neutron uh, implementation may have it natively, uh, but if it doesn't, you can always drop one in. And so you need an interface here between the border gateway and the rest of the cloud. And the interface is, we hope, the layer two gateway API. Okay, it's not exactly suited for this today, but with a few tweaks, um, we believe that this is possible. So we'll be, we'll be uh, trying to, to, to discuss this with the community um, over this week. What other interfaces? So on the north side, we want that the orchestration layer can talk to both border gateways, and we don't want the border gateways to have to be the same implementation or the same vendor. What do, so we need, a, we need a standard API on top of the border gateway. That's, today, that could just be OVSDB on its own. So OVSDB to, to manage tunnels, and, and uh, with, with some modifications to OVSDB, some minor tweaks, yes, but that, that could be OVSDB. And then the, the, between the two border gateways, we have already have tunneling protocols which are standardized, so that, that's already taken care of. So, um, does that sum it up? So. All right, great. So, questions, and we could start with this gentleman's question about, about layer two gateways, or as, as you wish. Is it an appropriate time? Partly, partly answered. Partly answered, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and the question there will be when you're extending the N2 over uh, the, 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 the tunneling, if you have the, the site over here, I think two, two sites before this. Yeah, yeah, public 
This one. Yeah. So, so here, uh, because you're using the same subnet across uh, the cloud, assumption is there is some control protocol, BGP or something, which is, you know, the, the, doing so the magic. This depends a little bit on, on, on the vendor and the implementation. So maybe this is what uh, Ayal was answering before. Yeah, okay. Do you want to take the mic and maybe, um, I mean, it goes back to Ashed's talk, which is again, at what time? 5.30. 5.30 today. Right in this room. Well, yeah. perfect. Exactly. Just get some coffee and stay Okay, here. so back to your uh, original question. So do we have a control protocol between the border gateways? And the simple answer is we do not want to mandate that because once we mandate a control protocol, both sides need to support the same, uh, the same standard or the same protocol, and that kills the opportunity of having different vendor boxes, right? So I need a... Uh, if I have a Cisco uh, box or a Huawei box on the left uh, and I'm going to my public cloud, uh, I need a, uh, the same uh, implementation or a virtual implementation on the right. Um, what we did was we, s we went to the L2 Gateway um, community and we're trying to push these concepts and the deltas into the community so that this will actually be standalone. You don't have to use TriCircle to use this. Um, and what we need is the ability to create tunnels, and you don't need a control protocol for that, and you need L2 population um, locally. So we've, we're defining these APIs on both sides, and then as long as you're using the same tunneling protocol, you don't need to run, run back and forth any control messages between the border gateways. Does this make sense? Yeah. Will, how will the route, because you're actually routing the same segment. So what you need to do, the orchestration layer needs to remove that uh, MAC from, the, from one border gateway, go to the other border gateway and populate it, right? So there are two options. Either you come from outside and manage this with an external uh, management layer like TriCircle, or your border gateways can uh, negotiate between them and pass this information, right? Uh, uh, gratuitous ARP or any other way. So the north-south traffic, the receiving side, how would you, how would you tell your upstream router that? So if, if I'm migrating a virtual machine, this is not something that happens automatically. The uh, orchestration layer knows that it's moving the virtual machine from one side to another. It's a very simple matter, a matter of uh, removing a, uh, uh, an L2 entry, an ARP entry on one side, introducing it in the other, and problem solved. You're asking about north-south from outside okay. the cloud? Okay. Yeah, so I'm using TriCircle. Yep. And I've lost connection to the site. Yep. What's to stop the applications on that site running amok? Okay. Um, actually, we don't want to stop those applications from running. We want the ability to run local operations, right, and have, um, and have the top synchronized <coughs> later. This is a short talk and I have not been able to cover everything, but really we want a lot, as much independence as we can give. Uh, if we're talking about IPAM, then we want uh, some, um, some individual uh, abilities at the bottom, so we'll maybe split up the, the shard, the uh, subnet into sites, allocate according to demand, and then the top just needs to, um, to do IP management when one site is running low on uh, IP addresses. So then you can start running out local uh, applications and have the top learn once uh, connectivity comes back. Maybe I'll chime in for a second. Yeah. Um, so so uh, our colleagues at Huawei have thought through a lot of this. They've been working on it for a long time. <laughs> um, but of course, and, and you know, the, the attitude you'll get from them because they're bringing in and they, they, they're inviting people into the project yes. uh, very openly and they have a great way to work together. Um, but it's a conversation. And, I, and, and my answer to your question is that it's a matter of policy. What do you want your site to do when it's, when it's uh, partitioned away from the others? And, and, we, and, and I hope what we'll develop over time is, is alternative policies where uh, a site should just stop doing stuff because it's no longer consistent with, with uh, the, the, the majority, the quorum. And another, po another p uh, policy where the, it continues to work because you want high availability over consistency. Yeah. Other questions? 
Are we on time? Yeah, we still have two more minutes. Last question, maybe? Yeah. Is it the end result pretty much all of the issues that you tried to describe in the, I mean, as a standard? Sorry? Can Is it the end result pretty much all the issues that you tried to with regard to the consistency of mass movement? So Have we solved them? No, no. E e the claim is EVPN cl uh, solves EVPN. all these issues. Okay. So EVPN is a, is, a, is, a, is a standard technology. We're talking about here deploying different technologies, different vendors, different clouds, right? It's not just about the connectivity. Does that make sense? Yeah? I mean, yes, yes, we could all agree to, 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 uh, to deploy EVPN. I actually, I actually am not, I don't know much about EV EVPN, okay? So maybe we should talk. But I, I think the problem is more complex because there's the integration of, there's the layer two gateways here between the border gateways, right? So, and then they're, they're the models that you want to use. And if you do this, um, I'm, I'm arguing that you don't want to have every single tenant and every single network do its own VPN. That's not efficient. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much.